Hi, I'm Adam Porter and this is my board gaming vlog and I know I've had a bit of a break for a few months. Unfortunately, uh, I haven't had the time to make these videos. It's been because I've been devoting so much time to designing games. Um, as you'll know, over the last few years I've been designing games. I've been regularly going to Playtest UK meetups, which are meetups of um, designers trying to make inroads into the industry. Uh, I meet weekly with a group in Cardiff and then I also meet with a group in Bristol and uh, Oxford and occasionally up to London and Birmingham. Uh, and I've been doing this for years now. I've got to the point where I've got a few games, five games, uh, waiting to be published, so they should be out over the coming months. Um, and so I'm starting to get a bit of a feel for the sort of problems people hit when they're designing games. And I thought that's what I'd talk about in this video and hopefully over a few videos um, coming up over the next few weeks or months. Um, so in this particular video, I wanted to talk about the pitfalls that people hit when they're first time designers. And uh, specifically, I want to talk about dice and randomness in first time designs. Okay, so to get it out there straight away, I designed dice games. Two of my games, which are coming out soon, will be dice games. But they are specifically dice games. They are games entirely based around dice, around rolling dice, mitigating their luck, manipulating those dice, um, push your luck sort of gambling sort of elements to them. They are not large games that use dice for a degree of randomness within those games. And that's what I'm talking about here when I say to you, dice are not the answer. In a first time design, frequently when prototypes come to our group, we'll find that there will be roll and move mechanisms. So that basically is the old style um, Monopoly style game where you roll the dice and you move that many spaces. You have no choice about where you end up. Or maybe you have the choice of going left or right, as in a game like Talisman. Again, an old game now. We're looking back to the 1980s here. This is not modern stuff. Um, but basically your move is dictated by the dice roll. The other thing I see frequently is roll for combat. Now this is much more present in the modern board gaming hobby. It's still used in a lot of American style games particularly. Um, so when we're fighting, battling, fantasy games, sci-fi games, rolling the dice in order to resolve combat. And then the other thing is just uh, randomness all over the place. And to me, this is really uh, characterized by the event deck. Frequently I see this in a first time designer's game. Um, an event deck, a deck of cards, and on at the beginning of a round or at the beginning of a player's turn, they draw an event and something random happens. Now, it might wipe out one entire portion of the board and all the pieces on it. It might take away all of a player's resources or all of all players' resources. It may reset the work that has been carried out over half an hour or an hour of gameplay, and that can be deeply frustrating. So the first thing I'm going to do is just go through this collection of games here and let's have a look and see how many of these games feature roll and move mechanisms. So if we take a look at my collection and starting at the top and moving down, how many of these games that you can see here feature roll and move? Well, the answer is none of them. Even these adventure games where we're moving around a map, they don't tend to feature roll and move, not even in something like Super Dungeon Explore, which is your classic dungeon crawler, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is a miniatures battle game. Not even in Imperial Assault, we don't see roll and move in there. As we come down here, there is one game which does, and this is Marrakesh. This is a children's game with a big chunky dice where you can move about on the board. That has a bit of roll and move in it. And further down, as we get to some of the older games, well, Hero Quest, that certainly features roll and move. None of the games on the next shelf, none of these at all feature roll and move in them. And then as we go along the top, there's no roll and move in here. And in fact, until you come down to this shelf here, which has three racing games, this is where we see some roll and move starting to happen. So Formula D, this is a straightforward racing game, rolling dice, moving around the track, um, but it has an ingenious mechanism uh, to, to, to deal with that. And then these two racing games here, both have roll and move in, and actually there's a similar game a little further along, which is the game Manila. This is similar in feel to Camel Up. Uh, again, you're rolling dice and moving things. Aside from that, none of the games in my collection here have roll and move in them at all. 
So Monopoly is a bit of a classic example here because it has roll and move and then it also has event decks. It has two of them, community chest and chance. So when I land on a chance space or a community chest space, which is through no strategy, through no fault of my own, I haven't decided to go there, just the dice roll has taken me there, I draw a card and something bad might happen to me or something good might happen to me. Now that is chaotic, it's unskillful. It's sort of entertaining momentarily to go, ah, I've got 20 quid. You know, it's not fun to lose the 20 quid, although it may be fun for the other players to laugh at me in a mean-spirited way. Um, but ultimately it leads to a frustrating gameplay experience. Um, so Monopoly has a bit of both. Hero Quest was a favourite game of mine as a child, the old MB Games, Games Workshop game. Um, so Let's have a little look at a bit of, of uh, Hero Quest in action. So here we have an elf. He's in a room with two orcs. He wants to get away from the orcs, but the only way he can do it is by rolling a dice. He rolls them. He gets two ones. So he can only move two spaces of a possible 12. He moves two spaces away from the orcs. He now, well, he, he, he can't fight, so he decides he's going to search. So he draws a treasure from the treasure deck, but it's not a treasure. It's a wandering monster, an event from the event deck. So a Chaos Warrior is placed on the board. And if we have a look at the Chaos Warrior card here, we can see he rolls three attack dice. So now we have combat by dice. He rolls three skulls. That's three hits on the elf. Now the elf only has two defense dice. So he can only counter one of those, two of those hit points at most. So he rolls two of them. He's looking for shields, doesn't get them. Three hit points, elf is dead. Okay, through no fault of his own. Now the dwarf has a turn. Two sixes. Brilliant. He's, he's running away from an ogre and a gargoyle. He's got a 12. He's miles away. Okay, now what did he do differently to the elf? Nothing. And yet the elf is on the floor and the dwarf gets away. Okay, so hopefully you're starting to get the point. Once we introduce this degree of randomness into a game, then all strategic decisions and tactical decisions cease to matter. It doesn't matter how interesting and, and, and ingenious your game design is, it's going to be completely undermined by the luck and chance in the game, unless it's a very, very short game. I'm not saying you can't use uh, roll a move or roll for combat in games, but I think they should be reserved for experienced game designers they're no longer useful mechanisms for somebody learning, um, you know, introducing themselves into game design. In fact, I would say they're toxic. I would say they destroy your first designs. They can be used ingeniously, as in um, Formula D, uh, where a player can select which type of dice they want to use. In fact, let's look at all the alternate mechanisms for moving around the board. What else could we do? So here are a bunch of games where you move around the board throughout the game. How many of these use roll and move? Not that many. There are a few. There are a few in here. So specifically, there's Formula D, which uses its clever sort of dice system where you choose which type of dice you want to use, what size of dice, and you can work your way up through the gears. So you might be using a big chunky 30-sided dice that comes with additional risks, or you might use the nice and safe uh, little four-sided or six-sided dice. Um, so that is how Formula D gets around the problem. Camel Up, this one uses dice rolling, but here we're gambling on where the playing pieces are going to end up. So the playing pieces in Camelot and in Winner's Circle and in Manila, the playing pieces don't belong to any particular player. Uh, so when we roll the dice and move those pieces, it, it's a case of we're, we're betting on which ones we think are going to get there first. So that is roll and move, but not in the sense that we've seen it in old fashioned games. Now, if the game's over here, so this is Super Dungeon Explore, Forgotten King, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Star Wars Imperial Assault. If these had come out uh, 15, 20 years ago, they would have definitely had roll and move in them, but they don't. In here, we tend to have asymmetric um, player powers, so the, the different characters in the game can move different amounts. Um, albeit in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, there is a dice roll, but there's plenty of opportunities to mitigate those dice. Then we have a whole load of games which have action selections. So in Forbidden Desert, 
in Flashpoint Fire Rescue, in Raptor. The players have a number of action points. In Raptor, that's generated by some card play. In Flashpoint, it's kind of set in stone. And those action points can be used either to move or to carry out various other actions like attacking or putting out fires, things like this. We have a couple of games down here where we literally flick the pieces across the playing space, so flick them up in catacombs. Steampunk Rally is an interesting one because here we actually build an engine. You know, we, we put resources into this engine and we put together cards that, that generate movement points and allow us to move around the track in a race. So that's an interesting combination of Euro game mechanisms and movement. Uh, and then we get onto games like Takanoko and Ricochet Robots, where you can basically move as far as you like, but in a straight line, and when you hit a barrier, you have to stop. Marrakesh is true roll and move, old style roll and move, very simple children's game, and so perhaps it feels a little bit more appropriate in that one. Now, roll for combat. I know I'm going to have a harder time convincing you of this, that it's not worth using um, because it's used so frequently in so many games. And also, I'm well aware that my collection leans well away from the sort of games that use combat at all, let alone roll for combat. So I may not be the best person to speak on this. That said, I think roll for combat is so generic now that... It's very hard to make your system of rolling to fight interesting and different and, and, and make your game unique. And, and if, even if you have all sorts of other unique stuff going on in your game, that role for combat just overwhelms it and, and, and undermines everything else that you're doing there. So find other interesting ways of, of, of doing combat, whether it's to do with card play or, um, you, you, you know, there, there are other randomizers or maybe it doesn't need to be random at all. And finally, the dreaded event deck. So uh, what, what exactly is this all about? Well, I think players are introducing, designers are introducing event decks because they want their game to have a narrative drive. They want story elements in their game. They become so immersed in the world of their game. They think this, this, this world would have earthquakes and volcanoes and tornadoes or dinosaur attacks or whatever. And so therefore the only way they can factor those into the game is to have a card draw which says dinosaur attacks, lose a turn, or dinosaur attacks, move back three spaces. And, and it can be devastating to your design. It can completely make everything else meaningless because it, it can throw you back so many paces. Everything you've been building up wiped out or you lose the game just on a card draw. So how do games introduce those narrative elements without the randomness of this card draw? Well, if we look at games that have events in them, so games like Evolution Climate or Twa or dominant species, what tends to happen is that a series of events are laid out at the start of a round or several turns ahead, and then players have a chance to react to this, maybe to deal with the event by putting some resources into it to make that event go away, or maybe by taking control of that event to ensure that it doesn't happen to them, but they can drive that event towards another player. Now, that is not uh, total chaos. That is not total luck because the other players have seen that event is there too. And if they wanted to, they could take it and drive it in that direction. This is how it works in a massive strategic Euro game like Dominant Species without making the whole thing chance based. The worst type of event decks are the ones where you have random events sort of interspersed with useful cards. So when I draw a card from a certain deck, I think, oh, this could be really something useful, a useful resource for me or a card I could play to advance myself in the game. But then when I draw it, actually, no, it's just set me back several turns or in fact, it may have destroyed my total game experience. Let's have a look at the event decks in Agricola. Agricola has two decks which uh, two decks of cards which you can add into the game as little expansions, which are event decks. That's exactly what they are. In fact, I've got them on the table over here, so I'll show you. Um, so these are sort of almost promo items, really. There's the Legendary Forest deck and the X deck. And what this means is when you go and gather wood in Agricola, which is Agricola's very strategic game, you gather wood to build fences, to house animals, you cook the animals to make food, to provide for your family. A lot of the game is, is about building up to gathering new family members, having this family growth action. You'll spend the first half of the game trying to make your house big enough, make sure you've got enough food to have that extra family member. 
Now, in the Legendary Forest deck, every time you go and gather wood, you draw a card off the top of the deck. Or in the X deck, every time you go to the to gather stone in the quarry, you might encounter aliens, so you turn over a card off the deck. So let's have a look at the top deck of the X deck. Earth girls are easy. Immediately carry out the family growth, even without room in your home action. So I've already said the first half of the game for most games of Agricola is spent trying to get yourself ready to have a new family member and make it possible. With the single draw of a card from an event deck, this is giving one player that um, ability. That player now is, is most likely going to win. Certainly they're at a huge advantage through no skill whatsoever. So these are classic examples of event decks. Fortunately in Agricola they're kind of treated like a joke. Nobody really plays with them. They're quite humorous and so you can sort of flick through them and enjoy thinking about what that game might be like without actually having to suffer an actual game of Agricola with an event deck. A board game design is only as good as the decisions that a player makes on their turn. How many decisions are there in your, uh, in your prototype? How many decisions can a player make on their own turn? What do, dilemmas do they have? Do they have choices? Are those choices interesting? Are they equally as exciting whichever way they go? Are they overwhelming choices or are they at the right sort of level? Does it matter whether they go that way or that way or will the result turn out the same anyway? This is what we're looking for. Meaningful, interesting decisions. Unless you're making a game like um, Villa Paletti or Bandu or Junk Up where you're stacking pieces or something where you're flicking or a speed game, in which case decisions don't really come into it. In a strategy game, we want choices and those choices have to mean something and they have to be fun and, and sort of delicious little puzzles for us to solve. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this first in my little design series. Ho well, hopefully it'll become a series. Uh, I'm Adam Porter. If you want to watch the other view videos on my channel, then please do. It's Adam's Board Game Wales. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Board Game Wales. Thank you very much for watching. All the best.